Thank you so very much indeed. Honourable uh, attendants, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organisers of inviting me to address this seminar. And I must say that I'm a very great friend of uh, cooperation between Nordic Council and Baltic Assembly. And I remember the years in the beginning of 19, in, in 1990s when we established the cooperation and that way strengthened the independence of all Baltic countries. Uh, the energy challenges are high on the Nordic agenda, and I would like to share with you some of our experiences. The energy challenge is one of the most complex challenges of our times. The positive developments of our economies over the last 60 years have been based on access to rel relatively inexpensive and easily accessible energy. Now we are faced with the fact that the energy prices have been rising and are expected to continue to do so in the future. Furthermore, we have uh, to face the challenges of reducing the emissions of the climate gases by 70 or 80 percent uh, by the middle of this century. We have to meet this challenge from both a regional perspective and national perspective. We even have to address it in a global perspective in our effort to curb the emission of climate gases. As a politician, my obligation is first and foremost to my national constituency. The citizens of Finland, they request reliable, clean and safe energy at affordable price. And if they don't get it, they become very angry. Furthermore, however, as a politician, I have to approach this issue from the perspective of coming generation, our children, or what we shall call sustainable development. At the same time, I recognize that we in Finland are subjected to European Union energy policy, as in all European Union countries, and that is addressing this issue from a regional perspective, searching for solutions that strengthen our region as a whole. Fortunately, our experience in the Nordic countries demonstrates very clearly that cooperation across borders can yield many benefits. The electricity market between Finland, Denmark, Norway and Sweden is considered as one of the most integrated in the whole world. Harmonized and advanced cross-border electricity markets are functioning very well. We have managed to merge four distinct national markets into one single and common market. This, this is due to both the fact that the effort has received full political support and the fact that the cooperation between numerous market participants is well developed. There has been a dialogue with Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia about how this market could be successfully expanded. Links with other parts of Europe are also being developed. But if I may urge, it would be very useful for Baltic countries to be a part of the Nordic electricity market because that would lead into a situation where the energy prices would be lower and actually it would certainly uh, increase the uh, security of supply as well. We have learned that the Nordic electricity market is an important prerequisite for increasing the share of renewable energy. By linking the systems, we can exploit the comparative advantages in each country. Hydropower in Norway and Sweden, wind in Denmark and bioenergy in Finland, supported with coal and nuclear energy. And in fact, the great idea of Nordic energy market is, first we use Norwegian, but also Swedish hydro energy that is cheap, clean, and then after that, so we use the nuclear power, that is also, according to my mind, very clean, and that means that it will be fairly cheap and it's environmentally very sustainable as well. Our Nordic market is a wholesale market. The goal is to develop it into a common end use, it means consumer market, by 2015. This is a complex, complex task which, if successfully implemented, will further develop the Nordic electricity market into an effective and well-functioning market. The liberalization of electricity markets, sometimes we discuss whether liberalization is good, but in fact in this case it works very well, 
the uh, liberalization and integration across borders has not always been an easy task for us politicians. We have witnessed, witnessed considerable price fluctuations, in particular during the cold period in the winter. And we see big articles in newspapers when it's cold, minus 30, 40 degrees in Finland and Sweden, Norway, and the prices are high, is the market functioning very well. But then actually when the prices are very low in the summertime, no one says that it's so cheap at this time, so something is not working very well. However, consumers, our voters, react to short-term fluctuations, even though these fluctuations are simply sending a signal to the market to limit the use of energy as much as possible due to short supply. A downside is speculative behavior in the market that can affect normal price adjustments. We want to increase transparency to avoid speculative behavior. And in fact, if the speculation will be very hard, it could destroy the whole market. And that is something we are not allowed to happen. Even though the Nordic countries have managed to integrate the electricity markets, they have not been successful in harmonizing support systems for the production of renewable energy. Denmark, Finland and Sweden have the ambition to increase the share of renewable energy in accordance with European Union goals uh, by 2020. Denmark from 17 to 30 percent, Finland from 28 to 38 percent and Sweden from 40 to 50 percent as has been told this morning in this conference. In order to facilitate development of renewable energy, the countries have implemented systems of support. However, as heard this morning, uh, uh, the form of support is not the same in all countries. Norway and Sweden have agreed on a common system based on a market-based instrument called green certificate certificates that were presented this morning. Denmark has a feed in tariffs and Finland a premium feed in tariffs. And this is a problem, or is it? For a Nordic politician, the answer should be at least yes, it's a problem. An analysis conducted for the Nordic Council of Ministers indicates that if the system, systems were harmonized, we would by 2020 annually save some 1.4 billion euros on our electricity bill. In light of this information, the Nordic Council, the members of parliament, recommended uh, uh, further work to harmonize the support. But the response by the Nordic Council of Ministers was simply no. The governments believe it is, not, it is too complicated to exchange existing systems and that will create uncertainty for investors and thereby reduce investment in coming years. This is, according to my mind, very unfortunate. And when we speak with civil servants in our own countries, they always say, we have clearly the best system, we have the best innovations, and other countries don't understand how good our system is. And sometimes it's very difficult to explain that there must be some best practice somewhere that could be adopted by all countries, at least countries that are otherwise very close to each other. In an international comparison, the Nordic countries have well advanced in the use of bioenergy. Finland delivers over 80 terawatt hours, Norway 15 hours, terawatt hours, and Sweden some 150 terawatt hours annually. And there is an explanation. We have paper and pulp industry that uses wood, and that is one side product of that process. There is a potential to increase the production of bioenergy. As a politician, it is my duty to look at the downside as well as the upside. What would the consequences for bio biological diversity, uh, landscape, outdoor life and cultural monuments be if the production of bioenergy would dramatically increase? And that's something the Commission has looked at as well. Though locally people, they want to get labor and work. Increased use of bioenergy will have uh, considerable negative environmental implications. And there is a considerable worry in every politician's constituency about this risk. The issue has to be addressed on the European level in the European Union, which has provided some guidelines for the member states. We have also used Nordic cooperation to develop uh, a label, and the label is called SWAN, and uh, that has developed criteria 
so that consumers themselves can make an informed decision. So when there is a sworn label, then you know it's done environmentally friendly, the product. Energy efficiency is a single most economic measure to reduce energy costs, as well as the emission of greenhouse gases. Energy saved is the cheapest energy. It is therefore a mystery, at least for me, that only a fraction of the full potential of existing energy efficiency measures is being used. This is really a paradox in market-based economies, a paradox that we politicians must somehow address. The Nordic Council has had this issue on its agenda for some time. Recently, the Council suggested binding targets for increased energy efficiency. The governments, however, again, seem to be reluctant to follow that recommendation. In comparison with many other countries, Finland has been doing relatively well in promoting energy efficiency, but in fact, more could be done. Energy prices are most likely the single most important parameter that has an impact on energy use, besides the investment in energy saving technologies. Energy prices have been rising and are expected to rise further in the years to come. The question is, why are businesses and households not taking this fully into account in their planning? The free market appears not to react to economic signals as one could expect. Is it because energy efficiency solutions are not easily accessible, risky or difficult to finance? Unfortunately, I cannot give the answer to these important questions. European Union's new directive on energy efficiency presents a number of concrete options on activities that will hopefully promote significant progress in the years to come. Uh, I must say that taxation is a very important tool in energy policy and uh, indeed reducing the emissions. And uh, for the politician, I must say the situation is we have to finance the welfare society somehow and what kind of taxes can we use? If you put tax on labor, it's not, not very popular, it's not economically very wise. In addition, so if you put taxes on consumption, they are not that popular either. However, if you speak of green taxes, so people understand you very well, we put green tax, that is on emissions, so people say that is very wisely thought. And that is why we have been raising in North European countries, energy taxes quite much uh, recently. And in fact, if I look at the amounts collected in Nordic countries, so the amounts are very high and they play an important role in financing uh, the welfare state. What you can do as far as energy taxes are concerned, so there can be two essential components. There is one basic tax, that means that you try to curb the consumption so that people, when they know the energy prices are high, consume less. And then there is another element that you can use, and it is uh, uh, guiding energy tax, so that you have higher tax, for example, when the CO2 emissions are high. So when emissions are high, the tax is higher. And I think these two elements are quite well adopted and accepted by the people in most countries. And, and I think that is one quite fair way indeed to uh, get adoption to policies in which people think at the energy prices and think whether they really want to uh, consume energy. And then when they choose between different forms of energy, so this guiding taxation will help them to make a right choice, not only by knowledge of emissions, but also through the price mechanism. However, there are always some problems with these energy taxes. And one is, when you speak of heating, when people get a bill to their own home, and they see, well, heating is that expensive, they become very unhappy. So there you must be quite sensitive. You can raise taxes, but gradually. And another sector is industry. If you put high taxes on, for example, electricity for industry, so then they have a great outcry and they are very unhappy. And of course, that can be very counterproductive against 
the productivity. So then I think on these two items you have to, you have to be quite sensitive and careful, but then you look at the situation in your own country and you can choose the right level of taxation quite well. The fact is that, well, usually when you put taxes, for example, on electricity, so it's a small portion of the bill, you gather a big amount, but still it goes a little bit unnoticed in the bill as well. And that's one good way to try to collect uh, money from taxpayers in a way in which they can be fairly unhappy. I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I try to respond to your questions according to my best ability. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And there are right away questions from the floor. And Baldur, please. Baldur Lost the Stockholm Environment Institute Talent Center. In your presentation, you claimed that nuclear energy is clean and cheap. I wonder how much the building of the old Kyoto tree has been costing by now and will cost by the end of or start of the operation. Thank you. That is a very interesting question. And I think people have different opinions, what is clean, what's not clean. The fact is that you don't have any CO2 emissions as far as nuclear power is concerned. Well, there can be some other implications and, and, and safety questions that, that could be raised. Uh, of the price of Olkiluoto tree, there's nuclear power plant being, being built in uh, Finland at the moment. It was started, in, I think, in 19, sorry, 2009, and it was supposed to become uh, ready 2013. It's not yet ready, and it will be ready most likely 2015. Well, I think the price why it was uh, chosen was quite reasonable, and it is the first of that type of uh, reactor produced by the French, and they wanted to come into the market, and that's why the price is quite reasonable. Now there will be a big fight, so the delay is quite costly, and of course, Teolle uh, and Voima, the energy company has high demands to the French producer. And of course, they try to have some kind of back claims as well. And we don't know what the final price will be. And I think that will be calculated uh, when the nuclear power plant is ready built. In fact, there are two other permissions uh, given by the Finnish parliament to build two more nuclear power plants in Finland. And one of them will most likely be built in uh, 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 northern part of Finland, north of Oulu, and the uh, uh, second one uh, would be the continuation of uh, Olkiluoto 3, so it will be Olkiluoto 4. But whether they will be built, so we don't know, but, but as said, licenses have been given, and it is quite likely that they will be built, but there's no final decisions concerning those plans done yet. So. Any further questions? I have one small question myself as well. Uh, the, we are in a region where actually we have also a very strong uh, player from outside in the market in electricity, uh, namely Russia. And uh, how would you see the different competitive advantages and uh, competitive uh, problems which we see from Russia would influence the development of the power market in this region and also renewable sector? Well, at least Finland imports quite much uh, electricity from Russia. I think the amount is about the, is equal to two nuclear power plants at the moment. The price is international fair market price, as I understand, uh, and, and, uh, and Russians so, uh, have been very reliable suppliers to Finland. However, there is some fear in Finland so that if there's a very cold winter in Russia, so, and we might have some lack in capacity in Finland, maybe even in Nordic countries, but there could be some lack in Russia as well. So what they will do in that situation, that has not been seen yet. Uh, then Finland imports uh, natural gas from Russia as well, and it's, uh, Russia is the only supplier of natural gas. And we are a little bit unhappy at the moment because the price has been tied to uh, oil prices and oil prices are quite high. 
and in fact there will be most likely oversupply of natural gas in the future because of new technologies and new sources of energy. And that will be very interesting to see what happens in that respect. But as said again, Russia has been very uh, res uh, responsible and, and good supplier and there have been no problems as far as uh, uh, natural gas has been concerned. Uh, what I'm trying to actually to get to you is in the question that, uh, for example, if we have the uh, coal-based uh, power production in Russia, which is, has no CO2 cost associated with that, and it is more competitive in the Nordic markets compared to renewables, uh, and outcompetes renewables in this market, should we do something about that or not? Well, of course, there are agreements on supply, and then, of course, you, have to, you don't have to buy all the supply that could be supplied. And then the price has a determining uh, effect in that respect. And as I said, in Nordic countries, so as long as you can get uh, hydropower, it's always the cheapest one, you take it, and then nuclear power, and then after that use in the winter time, coal and, and, and maybe even natural gas for heating. And, and in those situations, so Russians can be quite competitive. But in fact, I think even in Finland, why there are two licenses for nuclear power? So one of the reasons is that Finland tries to be uh, self-supportive, that we should not uh, have the need to buy electricity from Russia. And to be honest, I think Russians will be, with their own nuclear power, always competitive. And of course, as you said, with uh, coal power, so this coal is quite cheap with no taxes on emissions. So of course, as far as the price is concerned, so they can be very competitive. But I think they always understand they sell the electricity at the world market price. And of course, they can see that there is a small difference. But as said, I think of the cert to a certain degree in Nordic markets, so we should try to be self-supportive. However, there is one problem, and when the European energy market will be open, it is very possible because the prices are fairly cheap at the moment in Nordic countries, so we'll supply more energy to Germany and Central Europe. And because there will be a lack of energy, especially electricity in Germany, so that might lead into a situation that the Nordic countries supply Central Europe, and then we ask, how do we produce? And then there is a question whether we... Uh, produce more than we need to earn money. There is, people are quite reluctant at the moment in Nordic countries to do so. But, well, if you have economic problems, you, I think you may not exclude that possibility either. If that's done through nuclear energy, so I think then people will be quite hesitant. To, new, to build nuclear power plants to uh, export to Germany, I think that will be most likely, at least for a certain time, uh, excluded in energy policies in our countries. But then, as said, if we need electricity and it must be compensated somehow because we export, so then it's quite possible that there is Russian supply. But I think Russians can calculate the price so that if there's a need of energy, so they know what the price is and put the price accordingly. Okay. Thank you very much.